welcome to the Convex Conversation with me, broadcaster Helen Fospero. Today's guest started his career as a Royal Marines commando and after undertaking his first tour of Afghanistan, passed Special Forces selection to serve with the Special Boat Service. After two more Afghanistan tours, Simon Jeffries left the military and eventually moved into the world of health and performance to help others unlock their potential. He co-founded The Natural Edge and built a team of like-minded coaches to help people transform their lives. But a lot of what Simon does is based on his personal experiences, with wisdom gained from times he felt unhappy or felt he'd failed in what he was doing. Simon, it's great to meet you on a very sunny day in Bristol. How are you? Thank you very much for having me on. Yes, very well. Thank you very well. Good. I've got a bit addicted to your Instagram page and your latest post. You're looking for five men for your latest project, but uh, men of a certain kind, what are you up to? So, yeah, that was a little bit of a different branch out for us. So we put out a post looking for guys in their 40s looking to make a change predominantly around confidence. So refining that confidence. And the reason that's come about is it's a bit of a test. It's to have people, I guess, in the same stage in their life going through together because we've seen how much the power of community and that sort of tribal element And also we've definitely seen when people see that other people are feeling the same as they are. I'd say the most common theme that I've heard over the past couple of years is, you know, I've got a good job, I've got the house, I've got the family and everything looks great from the outside and I should be happy, but I'm feeling these things. I'm not feeling completely confident. I'm worrying about things out of my control. I'm not able to switch off from work is a very big one we hear. I think this has always been there. We always put on our best front, our best selves when in public, but particularly Particularly with or since the advent of social media, it's become intensified. And so we see these snapshots of everyone else and their lives, and we think everything's great and that we're the only ones feeling the way that we are, that we do feel this discontent or worry about things, and everyone's feeling it. We are all feeling it. And also, do you find that men are perhaps less likely than women are to talk about their feelings? So are you looking for the kind of men that will be receptive to the help that you're going to provide? I'd say that women definitely are more open initially. And that's something, I guess, a process I went through myself as well, particularly coming from the military environment, moving into the city and then moving into the sort of mindset work side of things. It's that understanding that there are so many different facets to mindset. I often get, and there's this kind of image that because I've been in special forces, I naturally have or inherently have a strong mindset. And that is true in the sense that in that narrow spectrum of that job, yes, I had a strong mindset. But you only need to look at you know the amount of guys who perhaps have relationships outside of that that are falling apart or other stuff going wrong to show that it, it's one spectrum. It's not across every aspect of life. And when I started to really dig into and get deeper and have that introspective work, you know, the relationship side of things for me, I definitely had a fixed mindset. So I was kind of like, this is me and that's it. And I can't change. And was avoiding having the difficult conversations and having that open communication that actually enables you, you need to have that go through that discomfort to go forward. So it's that difference between, yeah, I was very comfortable with physical discomfort, but then perhaps not so much with emotional discomfort. So that was kind of a journey for myself. And that almost put me on the path towards the natural edge of just that deeper understanding of human psychology, human behavior, and helping people make those changes. And yes, guys, I would say initially there can be that barrier to digging in deeper, but until you do that, it's very hard to move forward. You have to be able to shine a light on yourself, have that honest conversation with yourself. And that's, I think, the key word and something I actually put in that post. It's people who are ready to have that honest conversation and really look at those things that need changing in order to move forwards. And we'll find out, no doubt, throughout our conversation, how you help people like those people make those differences in their life. But the one thing I was really looking forward to hearing in your own words is is your story, Simon. And tell me a bit about your background as a commando, special forces operative, and, and, and who you were in those days. Yeah. So it's an interesting, it is a twisty, turny story. So I left university and joined the military, which is something that I'd always wanted to do. So there is a picture of me somewhere when I was about 
seven or eight years old, holding a sign that says, when I leave school, I want to be a Royal Marines Commando. So it's quite interesting that from that very early age, I had that set idea. And where that came from, I can't entirely tell you. Honestly, it's probably a combination of growing up in the countryside and watching too many 80s movies. Sneaking downstairs, v- VHS back in those days, recording Predator, Terminator, all those <laughs> films. And it just always, I think the, the adventure, the, it's just lots of the characteristics appealed to me. And it actually made life very easy because when you have a very clear path that you want to follow, it makes everything else easy because there's almost no decisions. You know what you're going to do. And so I joined with that intention, joined the Royal Marines, did the 32 weeks of basic training, which was tough as you can imagine. But the reason it's tough more than anything, people always talk about the physical. It's actually more everything around that. So yes, those are hard, but it's the times when the training team, you've messed up for whatever reason, and they're just about to leave and they get everyone to empty their entire lockers over the balcony, down to the bottom of the stairs, and then they'll tip mud and water over 40 sets of numerous within that sets of clothes for each of us. And it's like, right, 5 a.m. full inspection. And so you spend the entire night washing, ironing, folding. And it's those things that break people more than the physical. It's the lack of sleep. It's doing mundane and boring things. God, I had no idea that they do that kind of stuff. Yeah, it's an interesting, interesting, but that's actually the time on the flip side of that. A, it weeds out people that really don't have that desire to be there. If you don't have that strong desire, you will just leave. But what it also does is that's where you really bond. It's through those times when you bond as a troop. And it's the same through anything in the military. It's through the hardship that you bond. And those are actually when you have, that's where the most laughter comes from and the times that are the most memorable. So went through or joined the Royal Marines and then decided to put myself on the path towards special forces. And there was a few steps on that journey, but then did selection. And again, a lot of it, like the, everyone knows about the hills in Brecon. It is physically taxing, but more than it's Groundhog Day. Every single day, you're up at 5 a.m., forcing down as much food as you can, which you really don't want to eat at that time. Sitting in the drizzling rain. I did it in winter on the parade square. Then you're on the back of a four tonner truck, driving for two hours to some location. It's like, show me where you're on the map, right? Okay, next destination, off you go. And then you're on your own for eight hours with your own thoughts, walking through shit terrain, bogs all the rest of it. And again, that's what taxes people. It is, it is like I said, physically demanding, but it's the boredom, it's the mundane, it's doing it over and over again. It's the little things like having chafing, getting blisters. It's it's that what breaks people less so than say an intense physical test. So went through that, was successful and passed, and then finished up my career in the SBS. Did another two, further two tours of Afghanistan. And then after the military, I'll I'll shoot through this and you can dig into whatever parts you want, (laughs) but went to London for the very first time. So I left knowing that it was the right thing to do to leave. I'd done everything I wanted to do, but without a real plan, I didn't really know what it was going forward. And so for the first time in my life, I had that period where I didn't really know what the clear direction was. Got a job in London because my partner at the time was going there, got a job in a consultancy and realized very quickly that that just wasn't for me. And I then spent probably a month really taking that time to think about A, who I was and what I valued and what I wanted to do. And I think This also ties into mindset in the sense that mindset is a skill. And unless you make it an active process, things will never change. So in terms of, let's say, figuring out who you are, not many people make that a really conscious, active process, taking that time to really dig into who they are, how they want their life to look. And then as much as possible within the constraints of what they have going on, making changes for that to happen. You know, I carried around a notepad and I was just constantly scribbling in it things that I might like to do looking at different stuff on the internet, just doing researching. And I can tell you when it happened, I had an epiphany moment. I was sat on a bus going into work and I was reading the four hour work week by Tim Ferriss and I was reading it and I was like, online business, online business, which gives geographical freedom and something that you can create and it's not time for money. So something that's scalable. I was like, yeah, that ticks the boxes. And that to me, it was absolute clarity. That's it. That's what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. That's what I'll be doing. I didn't know how exactly it looked. And that then put me on the journey, made loads of mistakes with the first businesses that John, who I do this with, who was in the military with, we chased money, didn't work. We ended up broke. 
My relationship ended. We both ended up living in my mid thirties back at my parents' farm. So it was something like uh, the film Step Brothers, <laughs> sharing a car that cost us three hundred and fifty pounds, earning basically nothing, working from my mum's dining room table. But it was at that point that we started the natural edge because we said, "Well, let's just do something we're passionate about, something we actually care about, which is." mindset, health and performance and helping other people with that. And that basically set us on the path to where we are now. That's incredible. So I just go backwards a little bit. Can you give us a flavor of what kind of missions you're involved in in Afghanistan without any specific details, obviously, but the special boat service and the world of undercover operatives sounds, I'm sure to lots of people listening, very alluring, but how dangerous was it at times? And did you have to have a bit of a mindset doing those kinds of things that you're quite invincible? So it's an interesting question. And what I will say is that if, if something particularly traumatic happens, which I was lucky, I didn't have anything that has those lasting effects. Outside of that, operational tours, say in Afghan, are actually far easier than daily life. And the reason that is, is you're almost living a very simple life. So you've got your job, you've basically got your one job to do, you've got your kit to sort out. And then outside of doing the jobs, you're just prepping for them or you're doing training. You're in an environment where you're just with your friends the whole time. You've got no daily you know, bills to worry about, none of the little bits that causes stress for most people every day. So it's actually a very simple life doing a job that you love doing around people that you really like being around. So it's like the perfect environment to be low stress. So you have acute bouts of stress. So when you say on a job and you're in action and doing that, but then outside of that, you're back to a baseline, basically relaxing, which is exactly how we're meant to live. Whereas in modern life, what tends to happen is the opposite. There's very little acute stress, but we have lots of chronic stress. So we're getting triggered constantly throughout the day if we're not doing things to counter it. And that causes huge problems. So in that sense, the military is actually very easy compared to outside life. And it's something I've heard a lot from people we work with who are also paramedics, police. They're like, put me in those intense situations. Fine. Everything's great. Put me outside of it in the home. And that's where I'm suffering. I, I was very lucky. I had very good tours and is a particularly my last one I was working in a smaller team in the city of Kabul, running an arrest force. It was quite autonomous. And so it is dangerous in the sense of what you're doing. But on the flip side of that, you've been progressively exposed to those situations, dangers and stresses so that you feel capable of dealing with it. You know, if you went from a civilian straight into it, it'd obviously be overwhelming. But through basic training, through build-up training, through all the progressive stuff you do, you get to a position where you feel capable. And I think it's a good lesson or mindset lesson. It doesn't mean that you have perhaps all the necessary skills at that time because it's an evolving hostile environment and lots of different things come up. But you have that self-belief that no matter what happens, you'll be able to overcome it. You feel physically prepared. You've got a good team with you and you've dealt with enough or had other unexpected situations happen and be able to work through it. There's a saying in the military called no cuff too tough, which is basically you just make it work. You know, from the outside, everyone has the view and I <laughs> Yeah, I think everyone does. Special Forces is very smooth. It's all singing or dancing. Honestly, like the amount of time radios fail, things are held together, black masking tape, like especially in the UK where the budget's compared to say the States. Honestly, it's like just not as smooth as perhaps the image portrays, but you get it done and people get through it. And that just comes down to the guys and working together, that teamwork and just that attitude that failure isn't a bad thing. Things are going to go wrong, but you just have to adapt. You take the information, the best information you have, and you just make it work and you just take action as well and use that momentum as opposed to the worst thing you can do is that indecision and staying frozen and trying to articulate in your head all the different avenues and what will give you the perfect option, which in reality doesn't doesn't exist. Just take the best information, 80% and go and then re-roll. So being suited and booted and then in a corporate environment in the city, and I've seen photographs of you in, in a suit and, and on operations in Afghanistan. And just as an observer, it, it didn't really feel like it was going to be you. I think you've been quoted as saying that you were the source of the problem and that we can't change and adapt until I suppose we're brave enough to pick up that mirror and have a look at ourselves. Yeah, it's. I think that's probably the hardest concept for a lot of people to accept is that 
it's our perception of whatever the situation is that determines our response to it. But it's truth. And you, you can't really get around the fact that why have you got people in dire circumstances facing horrendous things, and yet they're finding that happiness there, be able to stay positive, be able to work forward through it. And then you've got people that have everything and they're miserable and they're completely unhappy. It's our mind that drives every thought and emotion we have and every action we take. And stress, most of stress is how we internalize an event. It's the reason why you can have a group of people and the same thing happens and every single person has a different reaction. If it were the fact, you know, the case that it's always external events that dictates, then we'd all react in the exact same way, but it's just not the case because we're all human and we're all very different. And that difference between, for me, the, the military and the corporate world Again, going back to what you asked about you know, the military, yeah, 5 to 10% of it is very exciting. There's also a lot of boredom, a lot of just the general crap you get in any other job. But you accept that because you love it and it's part of it. But it's very easy to have that, especially when you leave, that rose-tinted view and you only remember the good parts and you forget about all the rubbish. I think for most people, the hardest part of leaving the military and definitely for myself or including this is the environment. You're just around, you're basically going into work and you're just with your mates every day. And it's very hard to recreate that outsider. Going into that corporate city, the change of job, the change of environment, all of it was such a stark contrast. It just jarred for me with I guess my core identity and values and all the rest of it, which then causes that discontent and the stress and everything else. And it's when things started to move back into place as soon as I made that switch to having that core path. So even though I stayed in that job for another two years, just by then having a new directions like business, building that on the side, it made everything else easier again and click back into place because suddenly I had that clear direction and path. But what was the tipping point, if you like, that made you start creating the natural edge? And was there a moment or something that happened that you thought, this is what I want to do? This is where my purpose lies. This is where I can make a difference. What happened to make that happen? She says with too many (laughs) happenings in that sentence. It is. So it was after that, that tipping point was the low point. So the initial path was, you know, the initial businesses that we tried were, again, it was chasing junk and code. So we had a little bit of software that we were um, trying to make. And then a classic tried importing stuff for China and selling it on Amazon. It was basically, right, how can we make cash? We'll do something and build it and we'll, you know, sell it and make loads of cash. The kind of first initial entrepreneur excitement phase, which clearly didn't work. And it was at that point when we were almost all the way back to square one, completely broke, you know, at the time when mid thirties, all of our peer group are buying houses, having families. There's John and I living back at my parents, broke. In your 350 quid 350 quid that we're sharing. Sharing, yes. Um, Yeah, if we if we wanted to go on, so at the time we were both single. So if we wanted to go on dates, I think we were both on dating apps, we'd organise it at the same place and same time so we could share, share the car to go there. It was at that point where we just sort of, I guess, sat down and had that, the previous business, we caught, we were like, this isn't going to work. And really realising you spent all your money and all that time and just calling a halt on it was hard. But what it did do, it was also freeing. So we're like, right, okay, we've got nothing to lose now. Let's do something we really care about. And that was so freeing once we made that decision because it suddenly felt right doing something that we cared about, something that we'd always been interested in is that health and performance. Even within the military, we were the guys that were reading the books or finding the information for the latest edge, whether that's something in training or mindset, it was just been a natural interest for us. And so taking that, and then deciding to turn it into coaching. And part of the other reason was just seeing how much bad information there is out there. And that's, yeah, that was the turning point for us, that low point. That was the moment. So for those who haven't come across the natural edge, how do you sum up in a nutshell what you do? We focus predominantly on mindset. We phrase it as, or our ethos is mindset is skill set is not something you either have or don't have. But most people don't approach it like that. So a good sort of analogy or I guess metaphor for it is you wouldn't read a book on diet and expect to lose weight. You, we know for physical health that we actually have to go and do things to make changes. And yet for mindset, we kind of do the opposite. We'll listen to a podcast or maybe we'll read a book or try a bit of meditation. And we expect decades of neural pathways and ingrained behaviors to change. And it's just never going to happen. It has to be an active process. 
So that combined with our other big ethos is something we call moving average. And that is that you don't need perfection to make progress. All you need is your moving average to generally be in the positive. Like everyone wants that perfect diet plan, training plan, whatever it is. And usually what happens is we'll try and make a change. We'll stick to it for a week or so. And then life as always will get in the way. So you can't do that 60 minute workout you planned or whatever it is. And people just bin it all. So it's an all or nothing mindset as opposed to going, okay, I can't do a 60 minute workout because work's got in the way. I'm going to do a 10 minute walk. It will aid my circadian rhythm. It's getting me outside light a time off the phone, de-stressing if I can get around a park or something. So there's all these little things. It's a massive performance enhancer still, and yet we discount it because we think we need that perfect 60-minute 60, 60 workout. The same with a, a tip that I always give. If you're stood in a queue for something, what's the first thing everyone does? Get out their phone and start scrolling. Just be present. Just don't get your phone out. Concentrate on your breathing for that one minute, two minutes. We don't need to sit cross-legged. Meditation is essentially just letting the mind sit and just noticing what's happening. You can do that stood in a queue. And it's the accumulation of those small changes. That is the difference between people who really make progress and people that don't. If you're always waiting for those perfect moments, that set 60 minutes, that 15 minutes morning routine, whatever it is, you're going to really struggle. Whereas if you flip it around and just see it as a moving average and just always try and find those small wins, it makes such a big difference. It's habit forming as well, isn't it? Doing small things that can then become a habit, I think. And habits take yeah. a few weeks to get in. I've been reading a book about breathing. You'll probably James know it. James Nestor. James Nestor. Yeah. I went away for a few days with a friend and in the duty free, she's like, oh, you need to buy this book. I'm like, I don't want a book <laughs> on breathing on my few days away, but it's absolutely fascinating. Yeah. We do it 25,000 times a day yeah. and we don't put any thought into the, I'm a real shallow breather, I think. Things like that, I think are, are really important, but how do we wake up or realize our mindset? How do you, we've all got a mindset, but you've just said there, we're all too busy if we can't have that perfect exercise routine or the perfect food plan or perfect life, then we don't bother with any of it. How do we find our inner mindset and make it active, if you like? The first step is awareness. So as with anything, it is awareness until, say for somebody who's listened to this, this podcast right now and thought, oh yeah, standing in the queue, it's quite a good idea. And then the next time they're in the queue, it triggers them and they do it. Whereas if you've never heard that or been suggested that, then you're just going to go through your default behavior patterns, your default habits. And we're also, the environments that we have are designed really to make us do live in a way that we're not really designed to. So constantly connected to our phones. The reason you pick it out of your pocket every time, every opportunity is because we become very bad at sitting with ourselves because we're always connected and phones, you know, you've got the brightest minds from Cambridge, Oxford, MIT are hired by the big tech companies to design algorithms and set up apps, the rest of it to keep us engaged because that's their job. It's not, I don't think it's some evil game plan. It's just, a, it's a business. And so the more you're engaged on the platform, the better it is for the business. And so you're fighting smartly designed systems and devices along with your own biology, which wants that hit of dopamine. Like it's the easiest way to get some instant gratification. The same with the food environment. We're designed to move less and eat more. The same as every species in nature because it's survival. It's built in. The more calories you can get for the least effort, great, good for survival. We've still got that innate biology. We now just live in an environment where food is highly available. So you're battling your biology along with an environment. Again, Snickers bar, it is the optimum combination of crunchy, soft, sweet, salty. And this applies to anyone. I think people may look at me with my background and think, oh, you've got loads of willpower, so it must be easy. No, that's complete rubbish. If I go to my parents who have got an entire drawer, they always have like a massive sweets drawer. I'll go into it all the time and I will eat that crap constantly because it's there and it's easy. Whereas in my own house, I just don't have it there. So I try and always have, I make the best choice the easy choice. So by having good food, like I'll, I'll batch cook. So when we make something, use the slow cooker a lot or make huge salads. So there's always stuff in the fridge or around that is a better option. And so when you have that moment, when you're bored in the day and like feel something sweet, you have a quick look through the cupboards and then it will quickly go because it's not there. However, if it was there, you'd eat it. So often when you look at people that you think have just got more willpower motivation, a lot of the time, They've just got better systems. They're better at designing the environment. Like my phone, if we, I haven't got it next to me now, it is set up in a way 
So all the apps are hidden in folders. There's a couple out on the front screen and that's it. I don't have my notifications on. Like a massive tip right now for anyone, turn your notifications off. People often fight that in the beginning, but unless you're, let's say you need to close a massive deal or you're in something where it's critical that you need to respond instantly, what can't wait two or three hours? Because every time that's pinging up, you are fragmenting your attention. It is horrendous for your focus, for procrastination, all of these things. Turn all your notifications off, but have your phone on loud because it's not pinging up all the time. It doesn't go off. So if there's ever an emergency, people can still get hold of you. And then you choose when you check it. Check it. You be proactive instead of being reactive. So I'll check it, you know, every two hours, go and go through the messages or whatever. I cannot tell you how much of a difference it will make to your mental headspace and how you feel. Just adjoining onto that, first 60 minutes of the day, do not look at your phone. If you go into your phone, the first thing that you do, I mean, we just talk about it now. It kind of makes sense. How do you think your brain's going to be if you open up your phone, you go into the news, you go into images, you're throwing all the stuff into your head. Your head's going to be buzzing with it all day as opposed to just be present, go for a walk, just be with your family, do your routine. Do not look at your phone for at least the first 60 minutes. Like the longer, the better. And the same in the evening. If you just did those two things I've talked about there, you will notice a big difference with your stress levels and how you feel on a daily basis. I'm kind of identifying with this because on my little four days in the middle of nowhere, I was very frustrated for the first few hours when I realized that my phone would only work in the house on the internet. Then when I was out biking in the mountains and hiking and everywhere else, there was no 3G and no 4G. And at first it was like, ah, this Mm -hmm. is driving me mad. But then the amount of headspace, so reading about breathing, and I didn't have my phone. Modern civilization has become advanced, complicated, hasn't it? We're a long way away from the bodies that we were in caveman times, yet people seem to have become increasingly frustrated and unhappy as life's got more and more complicated. Do we need to strip it back, get our bodies moving, get out in nature as well, which I didn't realize how little I was doing of until we were locked up for a couple of years. And that's 6 a.m. walk in the park and listening to birds. And I live in the center of London, but being in green space was just amazing. I think, do we need to get back to nature? and Forest bathing. (laughs) Yes, yes. Yeah, I think... It's very easy to, again, it's like to have the rose tint of view of the past. You know, modern progression, modern technology, medical advance, all the rest of it has brought us huge benefits. But on the flip side, as we kind of just dug into there, there's also a lot of things that are making us more unhappy or stressed out, affecting our health. So it's taking the benefits of the modern society, but then making simple changes. And they are simple changes that work with your biology instead of against it. So exactly what you're talking about there, like how you start your day, not starting off through the phone. If you can get out for ten, just 10 minutes in morning light, that is going to kick off your circadian rhythm. So that light, the amount of morning light that you have, natural light, will influence the amount of melatonin that releases in the evening and how you sleep then. Getting out, even I think the minimum effective dose is three bouts of 20 minutes walking in a park. So some form of nature, but that can be a park in the city. And again, there is science that backs this up. The studies are now coming out with how much of a difference these things make. But you don't even, it's almost like you don't even need to know that because you know how much better do you feel everyone after you've been for a walk. And crucially, don't take your phone. Don't look at your phone. So these very simple changes, you don't have to go back to living in a log cabin in the middle of a forest to see these benefits. You can still have the same life, but if you make these small adjustments, you'll see a big difference. And it comes back to, again, moving average. Like in the beginning, if going to the gym, all these things is too much, just starting walking, get the crap food out of the house, do a few batch cooked meals a week. It's simple changes and looking for the consistency in them that that make a difference. You know, the elevator versus the stairs in London, it's always such a great, everyone's on (laughs) on the elevator. Oh, I don't. I live on the fifth floor and the times I think about, I should, if I'm training for something, if I'm going on a hike or something, then I won't use the lift for a couple of weeks. But five flights a day would be good, That's interesting. So do you know why, like, why do you do that? If I was was to ask you. (laughs) Because I feel I suddenly need to get fitter and and climb up and I hate walking up five flights and I'm always breathless at the top. Should do it all the time though, shouldn't I really? Well, so so what the important thing is, it's less, so let's take just a normal escalator, say on the tube versus the stairs. I'll walk up the escalators. 
So people look at that and most of the time, so they choose the escalator and it's standing still. And I think the initial thought is, is potentially oh, what different, you know, the calorie burning difference is so minimal, which is true between the two. What's the point? But what they're missing is that small choice is reaffirming your identity. And identity sits at the core of everything we do. So a lot of what we do with mindset work, when people are struggling with things, whether that's the food choices they make, procrastination or the rest of it, that's the end point action. And that's where people try to make the change. They try to force themselves to eat the right food, to sit down and not look at crap on their phone and, and do their work. And yes, you can have systems and habits that help with that, like how you design your phone or the rest of it. But at the core of it, it's your thoughts and emotions that are driving those actions to happen. And so you need to go the layer behind where that endpoint's happening, start making a change. And actually, even there with the thoughts and emotions, it's still too high up. You need to go a level deeper. And it's asked the question, where do your thoughts and emotions come from? And it comes from your identity. So how you see the world and when you interact with the world, it elicits thoughts and emotions. So it comes back to a comedian tells a joke. Why do some people find it funny and some people not? Why is it when, let's say you're watching a film and a scene happens and you're like, oh yeah, this guy did this because of this. And then the person next to you is like, I don't think so. I think he did this because of that. And you're watching the exact same things unfold in front of you, and yet you're coming up with different perspectives. And that is formed, you know, why is someone liberal? Why is someone conservative? Why do you wear a Breitling watch? Why do you wear a G-Shark watch? Why do we choose the brands that we do? Because that's how you see yourself and see the world, and you're reaffirming that identity. And that's formed from your childhood, your education, your experiences, evolution ties into it a little bit. And all of these factors are come together to make you, you and how you see the world. And nobody else sees the world exactly as you do. It's why we have such diverse viewpoints and you have people, you know, Brexit was a great example, such entrenched positions from people who really didn't have all the information, but their core identity was like, yes or no, this is right or not right. And so when we try to make a change, so that identity going back to the stairs, what you're saying is when you choose the stairs or the escalator is, I'm the type of person who's fit and healthy, I'm going to walk up these stairs, or I'm the person who's basically not. Whether you realize it or not, that's what you're feeding into your subconscious. So all these little decisions that you make throughout your life in the day basically reaffirms the identity that you have. So subconsciously or consciously, whether you realize you're doing it. And so the the way to long-term change is you have to change that identity. So it start making choices where you tell yourself, I am a healthy person. I am the person who's going to hike this mountain, whatever. I choose the stairs. And in the beginning, you probably won't believe it. And so what you have to do is have small wins to prove it. It's why couch to 5K is so brilliant because you start so small and so easy it makes it almost impossible not to do it. And in it's the beginning- It's achievable, isn't it? You've it's yes. got to be an achievable step. So therefore, if you said, go and run 5K, I'd be a mess. But if you said, walk for a minute, run for a minute, yeah. walk for a minute, you feel you've achieved something. I think people need to achieve to create long-term change. Because what does that achievement do? That achievement reaffirms that you're the identity of a person who can run, who can do this. And so in the beginning, performance doesn't matter. It's confirming the identity and building the behaviors. And as you do that, you then get more wins. You're more likely to make those decisions. Then you improve your performance. And before you know it, you are running a 5K and you're actually fulfilling the identity that you said. And then you are that person. You are. So the goal is not to complete a marathon. The goal is to become a runner. Is the best way I've seen it put. Get rid of the idea of willpower and motivation. If you just divorce that idea and concentrate more on habits and systems and becoming who you want to be, you'll have far less need for those things. And trying to rely on them just doesn't work. And you can see it doesn't work because people fall into what we call boom bust cycles. And this usually resonates a lot with people. It's like you start off and one week's like, I'm excited. I'm going to make that change. I'm fired up. And you kind of, yeah, this is great for a few days or a week. And then something goes wrong. You're like, oh no, I'm screwed. No, depressed. Yeah. Like, no, it's all going wrong. It's all off bang. And then you back down at the bottom and then you stay there for a bit. And then you see something that fires you up again. You're like, nope, this time I'm definitely going to make a change. And it's a constant up and down. And there's never that feeling of consistency and constant progress. That's what happens when you try and rely on motivation and willpower and don't look at all these other systems, your habits and little changes that you can make. The little change I've made recently that I was most proud of, if you ask my kids over the years, if we've been on holiday, I never go in the pool. I don't want to get my hair wet. I don't go wild water swimming. I'll look after the bags. But I've just discovered swimming in the sea. And the thing that I was most proud about on my little four days away was that I've led the charge and got everybody else in the sea. 
that moment when you get in is amazing. And I felt incredible afterwards. Are you a big cold water swimmer? Yeah, I do love wild swimming just because it ties into that whole, the outdoors and the, the nature and and how good you feel from it. And I followed, obviously, Wim Hof's blown up over the last um, <laughs> few years, followed his stuff. So I am a fan personally of cold showers and cold immersion. The science is emerging on it. So there does seem to be good research around our vasculature. So just having that vasoconstriction and dilation. Again, there's a book called The Comfort Crisis, which kind of digs into this. And the point being that along with a lot of other things in modern society, we are always at a constant temperature. So we're in temperature regulated homes and vehicles, and then we put jackets on and all the rest of it. Whereas just allowing yourself to be cold now and again is completely natural for human biology. But the other element that I like about cold showers or cold immersion is it's a good way to tap into your self-talk. And, you know, people talk about mental toughness a lot. And I think what's missed is you don't get rid of discomfort. You don't get rid of hardship. So people look at, say, you look at maybe special forces or athletes and think that you, you know, for them, maybe the pain's less so they can perform better. It's not that they, you know, that I feel less pain or heart on a workout or less discomfort with a cold shower. I've just got better at dealing with it and sitting with it and embracing it. I still have that voice that pops up before cold water immersion. It's like, don't do it. Why are you doing this? Because it's natural. It's part of it. It's going to be uncomfortable. That doesn't really go away, but I'm far better at understanding my own self-talk when that happens and being able to override it. So being able to sit with and embrace the comfort, that's something actually we work with people to do. And a cold shower or something physical is a very easy way to do it, but it has a crossover with emotional things as well. And you can do it with emotional things, you know, having that hard conversation that you've maybe been, uh, that you've been avoiding. The crucial thing or part of it to realize and what to remember is you need to pick times and situations as much as you can that you can control. So you can do something that stretches you, but doesn't go so far as causes a traumatic experience. So for example, if you've got a fear of public speaking and you want to improve that, going straight on stage and speaking to a thousand people will be so traumatic, you're probably never going to do it again. Whereas just doing a presentation to a couple of family members or friends, and then maybe doing a work one and progressively building up, just like in the military, progressively through training. Same with cold water. If you go straight in and you're like, I'm going to do a five more minute cold shower or immersion or whatever it is, probably going to feel really horrible and make you not want to do it again. Whereas if you just do 30 seconds and finish it with a warm shower, you're proving to yourself that you can do it while still stretching your boundaries and learning to sit with that discomfort. And if you apply to that to everything through life, so you're always looking to have one foot sort of in the known and comfortable and one foot in the unknown and the uncomfort, you will always be evolving and growing. And that kind of sweet spot is really powerful for that feeling of like you said, achievement of progression. When we try and stay safe and known and comfortable the entire time, chaos comes in anyway. Things are going to go wrong anyway. And because you've not been stretching yourself and learning to deal with it, it's going to feel even worse and probably have a much more intense negative effect than if you were progressively stretching yourself with those. And again, it's across all areas like emotional, having the conversations, physical, whether it's workouts or whatever it is, it's across all these spectrums that we need to be looking to do these things. I'd like to end, if I can, on transformation really. And I would imagine that's probably the most rewarding part of what the natural edge does, seeing somebody change in the way they want to change and and become who they want to become. What's that like for you and how satisfying is that? Yeah, it is massive. Actually funny. So the first one that popped into my head was a guy who wrote a little review for us the other day and he finished it with, so for him, he'd always had a little bit of imposter syndrome. And so not only did he say he's happier in himself, but he said, my wife's got her husband back and my kids have got their dad back because he's no longer short-tempered and impatient and basically is now can relax and be present. And because he's happier in himself, he's much better for the people around them. I think that's actually something key. We always, it can feel like a lot of people feel like they're being selfish by taking time to do this work or, or working on themselves. But actually by doing that, we're far better for everyone else around us and those relationships. And it is really rewarding when you see people, when you hear things like that, and it is sort of life-changing, then it is, yeah, it's very 
very satisfying. And no one quite changed their life like Percy Saruti, <laughs> who I was reading about on your Instagram. Just tell us about him. Yeah, so Percy Saruti, I'd go and is a very fringe character. So I only stumbled across him randomly, but you can go and Google him. But essentially he was an Australian guy diagnosed with three months to live, uh, decided to spend his last days sitting at the um, racetrack watching horses train because it was near his house. Had this epiphany moment that was a bit random. He just realized that all horses move in the same way. And so he decided that if you could find something similar for humans, a modality for fitness, then it would solve all the health problems. So that kind of gave him his spark. And then he just, you know, he started off, funny enough, he started cold immersion swimming in the sea, started shuffling all along behind the horses. And then that turned into jogging. And over the course of sort of months, which then turned into years, completely turned his health around. I think he had by the end like a sub three hour or just over three hour marathon. He had, he set up a training facility on the the sand dunes near where he lived with just an old shipping container. And he had people, he had like, I think two future Olympic athletes came, they became Olympic athletes and trained with him. And his whole philosophy was centered around, he called it the Stoughton Code. So it was part Stoic and part Spartan. And essentially it was just stripping away the excesses of modern life and living very simple, you know, a, a simple whole food diet, not overthinking training methods, you know, going out and running on different surfaces. He was very much against the whole, you know, you need a gym and all these kind of fancy things. It's like, if it's raining and it's muddy, good, get out and do it. Test yourself in all these different ways. Let the body move in, in patterns that it should be moving. And so, yeah, so essentially a very simple, simple life. And it, it, I think it resonated with a lot of people. And then he kind of just disappeared into the, um, into a bit of the ether of history, but a very interesting, yeah, good story. Great story to good read. Good story and a great, a great, place to end and, and thank you for I feel we've got some great takeaway bite size perhaps life hacks there that we can start to put in our life and obviously for much more detail follow you on the natural edge and, and maybe some people listening to this will come and do some of your courses which I think will be incredible thank you well thank you for having me on yeah if anyone wants to you know feel free to drop a message or we'll chat with people it's the natural edge on Instagram and Facebook and our website is the natural edge.com You've been listening to the wise words and philosophy of former Royal Marines Commando and Special Forces Operative Simon Jeffries, who formed The Natural Edge to help others reach their full potential. And as Simon said, they can follow him on socials at The Natural Edge. Says what it does on the tin. Don't forget to download and subscribe to our series at convex.podbean.com or search The Convex Conversation on Spotify, Stitcher, Apple and Google Podcasts, or wherever you listen to yours. I'll be back next week with another inspirational guest, so join me then. Bye.